Hello everyone, today we're going to learn about the mathematics behind principal component analysis or PCA. Uh, if you've ever applied PCA or read about it, essentially it consists of uh, applying an eigen decomposition, computing the eigenvectors of a matrix associated to your dataset. So today we're going to understand precisely why uh, eigenvectors give us what we want when we're doing principal component analysis. Uh, before we begin, maybe I should clarify what this is. Um, it's not that I've gone crazy, but in some of the last videos there was quite a bit of echo. So I looked a little bit online and uh, apparently it might be attenuated if I put some random stuff around my living room, which is what I've done. And that includes this, this mattress here. So hopefully it helps. But let's get to it. So the goal today is to understand the mathematics behind principal component analysis and in particular why we compute eigenvectors when we do PCA. The prerequisites for this material are multivariate calculus. In particular, it would be better if you know what a gradient is, what partial derivatives are, uh, linear algebra, in particular inner product, and I forgot to put projections there, and also covariance matrices, although we are going to review all of these uh, concepts briefly as, as we go along. Okay, so the motivation is that when we analyze data, we often want to find out in what direction the data have more variance. I'll, I'll explain more precisely what I mean by that now. So first of all, we are modeling data as points that have different features associated to them so that they live in a, in a space that has the same dimension as the number of features. To be very concrete, let's consider this data set here. Um, I'm just showing the scatter plot of the individual data points. Here we only have two features. So the data live in a, in a space of dimension uh, two. Okay, it's a 2D space. One of the features is latitude. The other feature is longitude. Um, in, you know, you might want to take five seconds to, to try to guess what this is. It's actually the locations of cities in Canada. Okay, the cities with the largest population in Canada. You see that there's a, you know, a high concentration here uh, where, for example, Toronto is and also Montreal. Um, and people like living towards the south where it's a bit less cold. Okay, so we want to analyze this data set. What do we mean by a direction of maximum variance? Well, um, let's, let's try to define this a bit more mathematically. We're going to represent, we're going to think of our data as samples from a random vector x, which in our example is a two-dimensional vector. In general, it will have the same number of dimensions as features in our data set. So what is the variance of such a random vector in a certain direction? If you remember your linear algebra, if you want to find a component of a vector in a certain direction, then you look at a unit norm vector in that direction and you compute the inner product. Okay, this is a very reasonable way that is <laughs> quite ugly what I drew there. Maybe I should use this. Okay, so the inner product between your vector of interest, in our case, this random vector, and that direction. So let's be concrete here. Uh, imagine that we want to know the variance of the cities in, um, in Canada in this direction, okay? In that direction here. So that would be V. So what do we do? We do the inner product of each data point with V. What are we doing when we do this inner product? If you remember, we're just kind of projecting it on this line. If V, I'm going to write actually, V is this vector here. If V has unit norm, then when we compute the inner product of V against each data point, what we obtain, let's assume that the, um, the origin is here. For example, for this data point, if this data point is Xi, the value of that inner product is precisely this segment, okay? This is V transpose Xi. So in order to evaluate the variance of the data in that direction, we do that. We essentially push every point onto this line by taking the inner product with the vector that is in the direction of that line. And then we consider uh, all of these lengths, the lengths of those intervals. Here, I've plotted a rock plot, okay, these little lines. Each line corresponds to 
the length of the interval. Um, the reason why they're positive and negative is that some of them end up here and some of them end up here, to the right and to the left of, of the origin. Okay, so here this is the density of uh, these components in that direction. And now this is a list of 1D data points, okay, the components in that direction. I can actually compute the variance. And that is what we mean by the variance in a certain direction of space. Okay. So in order to derive mathematically what this variance is equal to so that we can make some progress in terms of defining principal component analysis, we're going to use linearity of expectation a lot. So let me remind you that the mean of a d-dimensional random vector, uh, which we denote like this, is just equal to a vector that contains the mean of each of its entries. Okay, that's all it is. If we multiply the random vector by some matrix and we add some deterministic vector, we have linearity of expectation because of linearity of expectation for the mean of a random variable. And this is going to equal the matrix times the mean plus the vector. Okay, And, and we use this all the time when we're analyzing variances and means. It will also be useful to consider matrices with random entries. If you consider a, a matrix with random entries, we also uh, define the mean of such objects. And the way we do it is uh, the mean of the whole matrix is just a matrix where, where each entry is the mean of that entry. So pretty reasonable. And again, there's linearity of expectation. If I multiply the matrix by a deterministic matrix, which has deterministic entries, non-random entries, and I add another matrix, then that the expectation of that, the mean of that, is going to be equal to the, the deterministic matrix times the mean of that matrix plus uh, the deterministic matrix that we're adding afterwards. Okay, why did I tell you all of this? Because now we're going to go back to directional variance. And we're going to derive a very useful formula from it, for it. So remember, what we did with our data is we computed the inner product with um, a fixed vector v, and then we com you know we we looked at all those components, and you can in particular be interested in the variance of those. So if these data are samples from a vector x, from a, ve a random vector x then the object that we're interested in is in the variance of this component. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Now we're going to uh, remember that the, um, the variance is the expected value of, so maybe I should have, you know, called this component like C. So then we know that the variance of C is nothing else than the expected value of c minus its mean squared, okay? And this is exactly what we're writing here, okay? So this is just by the definition of variance. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the centered vector c minus its mean, just to simplify matters. And what we have is that uh, the, the variance is actually the expected value of the square of the component of the centered vector in the direction of v, okay? Um, you can you can easily see this here because you know you just take v out of the inner product by distributivity of the inner product if you want. Okay, so now um, we can write this in the following way. Okay, so if you're confused by this, here we have v transpose c x squared. So this is a row vector, V transpose, times a column vector, Cx, right? And we're taking the square. So since we're taking the square, this is the square of this. Maybe I'll put the, the square of this. Can be written, if we want, in the following way. V transpose, Cx, Cx transpose v. Why are we doing this like that? Because these two vectors are random. 
and they are going to stay inside the expectation. Okay? They are these two vectors. Those guys are going to stay inside the expectation, and what we see is that the variance in a particular direction is equal to V transpose on one side, V on the other side, and then a quantity that only depends on the centered random vector. So when we plug in V, different Vs on both sides, it turns out that this, which is, by the way, uh, the expected value of a matrix, because this is what Cx and Cx transpose look like. Okay, so this is actually a random matrix. So inside we have a random matrix. When we take the expectation, it's no longer a random matrix. This object actually gives us the variance in every possible direction. And it turns out that this object is the covariance matrix. So this is really the reason why we define covariance matrices. It's because they give us the variance in every possible direction of space. Okay, so that's the covariance matrix of a random vector. Um, it is defined as this outer product. That's called an outer product when you have a column vector times itself transpose. Um, and when you compute these things out and you can check on your own, uh, you will see that in the covariance matrix you get that the diagonal is formed by the variances of the entries of the random vector and the off-diagonal corresponds to the covariances okay, of the different entries. And oftentimes you just see the definition like that and you don't realize that uh, the covariance matrix is actually much more than just a list of variances and covariances. It gives you the um, directional variance of the data set in every possible direction. Okay, because what we've shown here is that this guy is just equal to V transpose the covariance matrix times V. Okay, and by changing V, you can get the directional variance in every direction of space. Okay, um, when you are computing things from data, essentially what you do is, as we always do, you replace the expectation by an average. So you take each data point, you compute this outer product, and then you average across the whole data set. Sometimes you can write n minus 1 here so that um, it's an unbiased estimator. It doesn't matter very much. At the end of the day, you end up with a sample covariance matrix where you have the sample variances, which we denote by that in the diagonal, and sample covariances between each of the features in the off-diagonal. Again, you, it's important to remember that the sample covariance matrix actually gives you the variance in every possible direction. Okay, and you can actually prove that um, if you do V transpose V, you actually get the sample variance in that direction. The proof is almost the same as what we did for the covariance matrix, so I'm not going to repeat it. Okay, so this is the covariance matrix for the cities in Canada. All right, so now we're interested in the question of where do we get maximum variance? So here in Canada, in what direction do we obtain more variance? For this data set, it, it's kind of trivial, like you, you, know, you, you might not be super interested in that and you might even be able to tell by, by eye, but when you have a lot, a lot of features, this allows you to select um, directions of this the dimensional space that are particularly interesting because things are happening. And you can use it for dimensionality reduction and so on, which we'll talk about in, in another video. Okay, but for now, let's accept that we're interested in finding in what direction we have maximum variance. In order to do that, what do we need to do? Well, we want to maximize this directional variance that we we're talking about with respect to V. Okay, we want to find the V where this maximum direction is, sorry, this directional variance is maximum. And we're in luck because we have an object that allows us to do that quite easily, which is the covariance matrix. Okay, so we have the covariance matrix. There's a single covariance matrix for that random vector. When we compute V transpose times the covariance matrix times V, that immediately gives us the directional variance. We just proved it. But how do you choose V? Well, now we have to maximize this function of V uh, this function with respect to V, okay, for a fixed covariance matrix. That's what we need to do. Okay, so let's uh, consider a function of this form. Uh, I'm going to call, um, we're going to consider 
function V transpose MV, where M is an arbitrary matrix, that is symmetric, because we're going to establish our results for arbitrary symmetric matrices. All covariance matrices are symmetric, so in particular this will include our covariance matrices of interest. Okay, it, I could have just plugged in the a covariance matrix there, but I just wanted to show you that the, um, the results are actually more general, and they're very useful in other areas of applied mathematics. Okay, so what is this function that we're looking at? This function is mapping um, a vector in RD, because V is in RD, where D is the number of features. In our case, in our example, it's just two features. It's mapping it to a single number, which is the variance, okay, in that direction. And it's given by that. So this function, where you have uh, a vector transpose times a symmetric matrix times the same vector, that's called a quadratic function in the literature. And it's actually, um, or a quadratic form, rather. It's called a quadratic form. It's a generalization of a quadratic function, so an order two polynomial, uh, two multiple dimensions. Okay, So an order two polynomial uh, is, just to be clear what I mean, um, if you have just a function of one dimension, so let's say q of a, okay, this is a polynomial of order 2, and they, they look like this, basically, or like that, um, or they can look like this also. So you can think of this function here, this quadratic form, as a generalization to higher dimensions. So here we only have one variable, here we have d variables, okay? I hope that was helpful. So now we're going to um, go back to our example, and we're going to look at the quadratic form associated to our example. So here we're in two dimensions. We have this covariance matrix, and with this covariance matrix, we can see the directional variance in every direction. So for every um, point in, so for every value of v that we're plotting here, so here we're plotting the first entry of v against the second entry of v, we get a different value for the directional variance. And these gray lines here are contour lines of the variance. So here the variance is 1,000, here the variance is 2,000, here the variance is 10, here the variance is 46. And this, why, why have I drawn a circle there? Well, that's a unit norm circle. Because when we compute the directional variance, we compute an inner product with a unit norm vector. When we're projecting these points to find the component in that direction, it's important that we do the inner product with a unit, for, uh, a unit norm vector, because otherwise we can always scale the vector and get larger and larger values, right? So in order to get the directional variance, we need v to have unit norm. So v has to be on this unit norm circle. So we're interested in this function that we're seeing here um, plotted in terms of its contour lines, where it's constant in 2D, we're interested in what happens in this uh, circle. For a moment, let's think about what would happen in higher dimensions, because often we're interested in applying PCA when there's, you know, a hundred or even more dimensions, not only two. In that case, we would be interested in the hypersphere in, in, in 3D. It would be a sphere. In higher dimensions, it's called a hypersphere all the points that have unit norm equal to 1. We're interested in maximizing the quadratic form over those points. And again, that quadratic form would give us the directional variance in this d-dimensional space. This is what this function looks like when I plot the values of the function of this function on the unit circle. So this is why here I have an angle. So I move around the circle these are the values of the function. If I'm interested in a particular direction, just to be very, very clear, then I'm going to be at a certain point. Okay, so this is the angle. So I, I forget how I'm taking the angle, but let's say that I'm taking the angle like that. That angle corresponds to this angle, and this is the variance. And it's important to remember what the variance refers to. Okay, so the variance, again, is when I take each of the points in the data set and I project them, okay, I can then plot 
all of those projected points and compute the variance of these values that's exactly equal to that value here okay which is the value of the quadratic form for that particular unit norm vector okay and what do we want to do we want to find the maximum and characterize the maximum in this case it's super easy we can do it by eye uh, when we have 100 dimensions it's not so easy okay so just just in case you're wondering like well are you stupid like look at the maximum it's there uh, in 100 dimensions it wouldn't be so easy think about plotting this for a 100 dimensional sphere life becomes a bit more difficult and as we will see there's there's you know a very clear way of finding it that is useful not only to find the maximum but also so to find the minimum and also to understand the structure of the quadratic form very well okay so we want to characterize the maximum and the minimum in order to do this first we should ask ourselves is there a maximum okay here clearly there is because we can see it but in general should we expect there to be a maximum for this we have to look at the quadratic form and realize that the function is continuous it's a second order polynomial if you just write it out it's going to be um, squares and products of um, and the, the entries of v with different coefficients so it's continuous oops i don't know what happened there okay we're gonna do as if nothing happened because i don't want to have to re-record um sorry about that so the function is continuous we are trying to ma uh, we're considering this function over uh, the unit sphere which is closed and bounded in particular it contains all the limit points okay so if you've done a little bit of analysis or a little bit of calculus that means that if you consider as um, a sequence of points the limit of any such sequence is going to be inside because uh, the set is closed and unbounded because the function is continuous, the image of the unit sphere through the function is also going to be closed and bounded. I know that this is getting a little bit mathematical, but you know, I just want you to know why we know there is a maximum. Um, this means that um, the image again is, is closed and bounded, so it contains all its limit points. Essentially, the function cannot grow uh, forever it will stop growing at some point and there we will have a maximum and that limit point has to be inside the, um, the image there has to be a point that achieves that value because the image is closed and bounded because the domain is closed and bounded and the function is continuous this essentially is the extreme value theorem if you're interested in delving a little bit more deeply into it extreme value theorem in in calculus or analysis okay so so there is a maximum we know that there is a maximum and now what we have to do, yes, there is a maximum. Now what we have to do is find that maximum or characterize it rather. Okay, so we know, I'm gonna call this maximum U1. Okay, we know just to, like, where are we now? Okay, we, we are interested in this quadratic form, which we're maximizing over the unit sphere, in our case, a circle, because we're in 2D. And now we know that there is going to be a maximum. But where is it? Okay, that's the question. In order to determine where the maximum is, it's going to be super useful to look at the, at the gradients of the quadratic function or the quadratic form. Okay, so here at each point, I've drawn the gradient associated to that point. So what is a gradient? A gradient tells us the rate of change of a function locally very very close to a certain point so this is saying that the max the direction where the um, the function is growing the most in this um at this point at this point here is in this direction okay i know that i just i always do this right i start putting i think maybe this will be clear okay so it, if we're at this green point the gradient the function is growing the most in this direction but the gradient actually gives you much more information about how the gradient sorry how the function is changing locally it actually tells you the rate of change in any possible direction this is called the directional derivative so the directional derivative of a function tells you how much the function changes if you move just a little bit so this is the epsilon here just a little bit so the limit we we look at this when the when um, the movement tends to zero 
in a certain fixed direction. Okay, so we are fixing a direction here, w. So this tells us if we move in the direction of w just a tiny, tiny bit, what is the rate of change? Okay, so how much does the function change with respect to how much we have moved when the extent to which we have moved tends to zero? Okay, this is the directional derivative. You can review it uh, on your own if you like. What's incredible about gradients is that they give us all the directional derivatives. Okay, the, the directional derivative in, in the direction of this w is given by the inner product of the gradient of the function times w. So the gradient actually captures the rate of change of a function in every possible direction at a certain point. Okay, just to be clear, here we are interested in the rate of change at a point v, so we compute the gradient at a point v, and then we see what the rate of change is in a specific direction w. So we take the inner product of the gradient with w. If that directional derivative is positive, that means that if we move a tiny bit in that direction, the, the function is going to increase. Okay, That's what it means. So we can find such a direction that if we move a little bit, it will increase. Obviously, this is going to be important for us because we're looking at a point that is a maximum where we cannot increase anymore. So at this maximum, if we find a direction that is in the constraint set, because remember that we're maximizing the function over um, a fixed set of vectors, not, not in general. If we can find a direction which is in the constraint set, so if we move from the maximum by a little bit and we stay in the constraint set, and we find that the directional derivative is non-zero, um, can we have a maximum there? And the answer is no, because if the directional derivative is non-zero, then either in the direction of w or of minus w, it's going to be strictly positive. So we're going to be able to move a little bit in that direction and increase the value of the function. So that means we were not at a maximum to start with. And, and, um, um, and, and so, so we, we cannot, cannot have, have a maximum. maximum. As, as long as, as and, and this, this is important, important this, this guy, guy so, so again, I've, I've made a little, little bit of a mess here. here. As, as long as, as this guy, guy is in, in the constraint, constraint set. set. But, but now, now you, you might, might be wondering, wondering wait, wait a minute, minute. our constraint, constraint set actually is not arbitrary, arbitrary. It's, it's very particular. particular. You, know, you know, it's, it's this, this circle or this sphere in the dimensions. dimensions. So, so, you know, know oh, maybe, maybe I should have done this before, right? Like, no. If this happens, okay, if the inner product of a gradient with a certain direction is non-zero and we stay, and we stay in our constraint set while we're in that direction, then uh, we, uh, we cannot, cannot have a maximum. maximum. So, so can, can we, we use this to prove our result? result? Well, maybe not, right? Because, because if you remember our constraint set, set our constraint set, set is very specific. specific. It's a sphere that is curved. So, so you, you might, might be wondering, wait a minute, can u1 plus any epsilon times, times a vector be in our constraint set? set? So, so let's, let's say that we're here. here. If we, we move, move in any direction, direction in a straight, straight line, line, we're out of the circle. circle. So, so no, because, because we're, like, like, we're interested in a very weird, weird, weird like, like in, in, a, in a constraint set, set that is curved at every point. Every, every time we move in a straight line, line we're out of the circle. circle. So this, this is very annoying, annoying because we would like to use uh, properties, properties about the gradient and the directional derivatives in order to prove where the maximum is. So, so what, what do we do? do? We, we need to characterize, characterize well, well the, the, the way out of this is basically approximating the circle by a, a line or a plane, plane which sounds, you know, sounds a bit strange, strange the first time you hear it, but this is actually done all the time in, in applied mathematics. mathematics okay? So what we're, we're going, going to look at is the tangent plane of this circle, and then, and then we're, we're going, going to see how the quadratic form changes, changes um, yeah, yeah. So how, how the quadratic, quadratic form changes on that tangent plane, uh, tangent plane at different points. points. And, and again, the motivation is that we have a curved, uh, we, we have a curved domain that we're interested in. We're going to approximate it by um, by a plane so that we can reason about the gradient. Okay, that's, that's the motivation. 
Okay, so, so what, what is a tangent hyperplane or a tangent plane? plane? Um, the, the unit sphere is the level surface of this function here. We do V transpose V. Okay, why? Because I mean, this is just the L2 norm of V, and when this is equal to 1, um, if that is true, we are on the unit sphere. Okay, in, in D dimensions. In our case, we're on the circle. So, why is in the tangent plane of the sphere, or of any surface that is given by a um, by a function like that, where we're setting it equal to a constant, if um, when you take, so y is in the tangent plane at v, if to get from v to y, you move along a vector that is orthogonal to the gradient of the function that determines the level surface. Okay, so hopefully that made some sense. We're going to see a picture in a moment. But uh, first of all, let's see why this is true. Or no, not why this is true, but what is special about the tangent plane. What's special about the tangent plane is that if you consider a first order Taylor expansion, which is just a linear approximation, okay, you consider a linear approximation of the, um, the function that determines the surface uh, close to this point V, that linear approximation is going to be um, that function plus the gradient times um, how much you move, okay? This is a first order Taylor expansion in multiple dimensions. Essentially, remember that this guy times um, the inner product between the gradient and a certain direction gives you the derivative. So this is basically just saying SV and then you multiply times the directional derivative of the direction in which you're moving, okay? That's how you update the, um, the value of the function S. If you're in the tangent plane, this inner product is zero. So that means that you keep the same value if you're, again, this is a, a Taylor approximation, right? So this is not exactly uh, true, but it's the direction in which it's almost true. So this is just saying that um, if you have your circle or whatever surface, you're trying to look for the direction in which you almost stay on the circle when you move. So it's certainly not this one. Okay, it's, it's going, going to be, be something, something like, like that, that, where you almost stay in the circle. When, when you look, look very, very close, when you look very, very close here, you're almost staying in the circle because you're going in a direction. You're, you know, this is v and this is y. And this is the vector y minus v. Y minus v is orthogonal to the gradient of this function. Okay, and again, this is the function where if you set it equal to a constant, it tells you that you are on that surface. So, so that, that is, is the tangent, tangent plane. plane. Um, you, you have probably heard of tangent lines, you know, two sets. And this is it's exactly the same idea. So in our case, this is what the tangent plane looks like at this point. Okay, so this is the point V in this case. Um, and this is the gradient. Okay, so all the points that are orthogonal to the gradient, uh, sorry, to the, to the gradient, yes, they're orthogonal to the gradient. This gives us this, the tangent the tangent plane at, at V. And again, the idea is that you can think of this line as directions in which you can move from here such that you almost stay on the sphere. Okay? Or in this case, it's a circle in general on the D dimensional sphere. Okay, so we're almost there. Thank you for your patience. We're almost, almost there. Now, here, what I'm showing you is at this point, the, quad the, the gradient of the quadratic function is in this direction. The gradient is much bigger, so I've normalized it so that we can look at the two together. Now I'm going to ask you, can this point be a maximum? So first we're going to reason a little bit intuitively and then we're going to look at, at the math. But, you know, just intuitively, uh, maybe, you know, take a couple of seconds to think about it. Do you think that this is a maximum of the quadratic form? And Maybe don't look too much at the contour lines, and, uh, contour lines underneath, which are going to tell you that it's not. But just in terms of the gradients, like why do these gradients indicate that maybe not? Okay, so maybe what you're thinking is that we want to see what happens if we move from this point V uh, and we stay on the circle. We cannot that do that in a straight line, but the closest we can get to doing that on a straight line is moving on the tangent plane. 
Okay, so let's consider that we move here in this direction. That doesn't look very... so let me look for another color. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to erase everything because I think red... you can see red very well. So let's go with red. So we're at that point and we want to move in this direction of the tangent plane. Why do we want to move in the direction of the tangent plane? Because this is almost staying on the circle. So there's going to be some point on the circle that has a very similar value of the function. Okay. Now we're interested in the directional derivative in that, in that direction. What is the direction, directional derivative equal to? It's the inner product between the gradient, okay, between these two vectors, the gradient and this vector, um, which is the direction in which we're moving. And that inner product here is clearly not zero because they're not orthogonal. So there is some directional derivative. You are going to increase the value of the function if you move in this direction. And because you're almost staying on the circle, this indicates that you're going to increase the value of the function on the circle so you don't have a maximum. Okay? So we see that there is a direction w, which is this direction that I just drew on the line, such that uh, v plus epsilon w is in the tangent plane. So when we move across, because that's the, the line that we've chosen, we've chosen to be on the tangent plane. Uh, you remain the tangent plane, so you're almost in the circle. And it's not orthogonal to the, or the gradient of the quadratic form, which means that in that direction, the directional derivative is going to be positive because we're going in that direction. Otherwise, if it was negative, we would go in the opposite direction, okay? Um, so we have found a direction like this. This means that for very small epsilon, we can find a y in the sphere such that um, the value of the quadratic form at y is going to be equal to very close to the, the value of the quadratic form as at v plus epsilon w. Okay, so this is what I was saying that when you move the direction of the tangent place, because of continuity of the, con of the quadratic form, you're going to be able to find another point on the sphere where the values of the quadratic form are very, very close. So that if this guy is bigger than b, bigger than v, I always have troubles with v's and b's because in, Spain, in Spanish we, we don't make a difference between them. So sorry for that. Um, this guy is bigger than this guy because the directional derivative in that direction is um, is positive, okay? But this guy that is on the tangent plane will be very close to some point on the sphere. So this means that we will find some point on the sphere that is has a larger value of the quadratic form than the point v. So we cannot have a maximum. And the key is that this guy was not orthogonal to the tangent plane. This was the key. This is why it cannot be a maximum. So what do we need? We need to be orthogonal, right? We need to be aligned with this guy. So when we look at all the values of the gradient along the unit circle, we're going to have to find a point where the gradient of the quadratic form is aligned with the gradient of the function that gives us the contour lines of the, um, the sphere. If you look carefully, this happens here. Okay, so the gradient of the quadratic form and the gradient of this function that determines the sphere must be collinear. They must be in the same direction so that this guy is orthogonal to the tangent plane. Okay? Um, if that happens, then when we move along the tangent plane, we have that the inner product is always zero. So then um, the directional derivative on the tangent plane is always zero, which means that Q cannot increase. Okay, so uh, that means that we are at a maximum. So this means that every maximum has to um, satisfy this because otherwise, um, because otherwise it cannot be a maximum. Okay, and you can actually do exactly the same argument for a minimum because when I was saying, you know, you will increase the value, you could always say, oh, then I will decrease the value. And you, there is also a minimum. By the same argument we applied at the beginning, the extreme value um, theorem. So uh, this can also be used, this same argument can also be used to show that if there are minima, which there are, uh, you're going to find them by finding, them, finding where these guys are collinear. 
Okay, so we're almost there. We almost got to the punchline. Uh, just to show you a picture, the maxima and minima in this case are when the gradient of the um, quadratic form are exactly orthogonal to the tangent planes. Okay, those are the locations of the maxima and the minima. But now let's let's see what this implies because this implies something quite cool. So uh, we need that the gradient of the quadratic form and the gradient of this function that gives us the, um, the sphere or the, the, the surface we're interested in, um, they have to be collinear, so there must be some constant lambda. I'm calling it lambda for a reason, such that the, grad the gradient of the quadratic form is equal to lambda times the gradient of, of s. So what is the gradient of the quadratic form? Um, if you know your multivariate calculus, I will tell you, otherwise you can you know, just um, brush up your multivariate calculus. We want the gradient of this guy with respect to u. It's actually equal to 2 times mu. Now we want the gradient of this guy. So remember that the sphere is given by u transpose u equal to some constant. Okay, so this is the function s that we're interested in. Uh, what is the gradient of that? Again, simple multivariate calculus. It's just 2u. So this implies that at the maxima and the minima, we have that mu is equal to lambda u, okay? Because of this, because we need these gradients to be collinear so that you cannot increase the value while staying on the sphere. So we have proved that this maxima minima happen at eigenvectors of the matrix. And this is, you know, pretty cool, I would say. Um, the reason why I'm excited about this is that for, uh, for quite a while I, I was just using, mindlessly using eigen decompositions to, to do PCA and reason about, um, um, about you know, different, different things in, um, in different courses. And I kind of missed at some point, like, well, I, I must have missed when they actually proved this. So then I went back and it, I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of these gradients and so on. And I, I'm just, you know, surprised that I was just using it mindlessly without understanding why um, it makes so much sense that these have to be eigenvectors, okay? Anyways, so the same argument can be applied to the minima, okay? And I just mentioned that. And you can also apply this to the maxima in directions orthogonal to uh, u1. So the idea would be, you say, okay, u1, we just proved that it has to be in the direction of eigenvector. Let me restrict myself to just be orthogonal to that. And let's find the maximum of the function that is orthogonal to that. You're going to find that it's another eigenvector by exactly the same argument, and so on and so forth. This actually gives you that when you take the eigen decomposition of any symmetric matrix, and I cannot <laughs> overstate how important this result is for applied mathematics, it turns out that the eigen decomposition of um, a symmetric, uh, uh, any symmetric matrix is of this form, where we have eigenvectors that are orthogonal, okay, and this is super important, and you have eigenvalues that are real. Okay, the eigenvalue is this constant that was relating the, the two gradients in the proof. And moreover, if you look at the quadratic form associated to the function, it's maximized by, um, it's maximized at the eigenvectors by the eigenvalues, when we maximize it with the constraint that um, this function, this vector that we're hitting the, the matrix with is, is unit norm. Okay, and again, if you restrict yourself to be orthogonal to the first eigenvector, then the, the next maximum, the next local maximum of this quadratic function is found at the second eigenvector. If you restrict yourself to be orthogonal to the first and second eigenvector, the maximum is at the third eigenvector, and so on and so, and so forth, and the maxima are given by the eigenvalues. And that's a spectral theorem, again, a really a fundamental result in, in applied mathematics. Let's go back quickly to our covariance matrix X. This basically means that if you want to find the directions of maximum variance uh, in a data set, or the, ma the directions of maximum variance of a random vector, what do you do? You take the covariance matrix, you compute its eigenvectors, and its eigenvalues, and the eigenvectors are going to give you the directions of maximum uh, variance, 
and minimum variance, and the eigenvalues are going to be the variances corresponding to, to those directions. Because remember that this is nothing else than the transpose the covariance matrix V. Okay. Okay, and again, if you're orthogonal to the first direction of maximum variance, then the second direction of maximum variance orthogonal to that first one is going to be given by the eigenvector with the second largest eigenvalue, and so on and so forth. Just to show you an example, we started looking at this data set and we just took a random direction and saw that when we, you know, we put all this, we projected all of those points, we got this distribution, it has a certain variance, which is equal to 200 something. Okay, remember this is the value of the quadratic form around the circle. Now we can actually do PCA and find the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue, and it's actually this one. So that's the direction of maximum variance. You can see that people are kind of spread out around the border where it's, uh, again, it's not as cold. And uh, we see that this has much larger variance than the previous, right, than the previous components because it's the maximum. Okay, the variance is, is more than 500. Uh, if you look at the second eigenvector here, we only have two dimensions, it's going to be the minimum. Okay, the second eigenvector gives you the minimum variance. You see here that the variance is much, much smaller. You see it also in the, this is a density estimate uh, using kernel density estimation. I should have maybe made that clearer before. And it minimizes this quadratic function on the, the circle. Okay, and that's it. Uh, we have learned why when we do principal component analysis, we compute the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Thank you very much.